we have some great experts on the panel on some of the issues I'm sure you, we are all looking at and trying to find the answer to. Of course, we will talk about competition and complementation. Is that the word that Walton uses? <laughs> In other words, do we fight one another or do we love one another? But I think we can decide whether we want to fight or love or embrace one another if we know what the issues are. <laughs> and we were talking before the panel that since we have the greatest expert in Asia or maybe even on the global scale, expert on crisis management, well, we'll start with crisis. And I would like to ask Dr. Sethi to predict the next crisis for water. <laughs> she has taken it seriously because I've noticed she has taken notes since we discussed only half an hour ago. So Dr. Sethi, when is our next crisis and where will it happen? <laughs> well, first of all, let me say how delighted I'm to be here and to participate in this uh, global forum, uh, the Wharton Global Forum. And of course, it's of great interest to everyone yes. uh, regarding what is going to trigger the next crisis. And probably we have, uh, well, we have seen more than 100 uh, financial crises actually in this recent three decades. So it is probably an eventuality that we will experience. Now, another if we, crisis. Another crisis. How soon? <laughs> well, <laughs> let me first of all highlight what are the triggers of such crises. Yes. There are three kinds of triggers. The first is a very unexpected development. It could be economic, it could be financial, or it could be political even. And uh, this unexpected development could be a terms of trade adjustment, like drop in commodity prices. It could be any political development or a contagion that is felt from one country by developments in another country. The second type of triggers are those where there's a buildup of excesses. And what are these excesses? Like over leverage, over borrowing, over indebtedness uh, by any particular country in particular. And we've seen this happen in Europe. Well, even the subprime crisis reflected uh, it to a certain extent. And these excesses are, for example, also uh, sometimes uh, policies that are unsustainable, that mm -hmm. are, are pursued, and so on. Then the third set relate to um, structural deficiencies. And these are also built up over a long period of time. Maybe the regulatory framework, maybe aspects of the international uh, financial system, uh, the monetary system, uh, has rigidities or uh, it has not kept abreast of changes that are happening in this world. All these can trigger, and when we look around us, whether these exist, and indeed they do, and therefore the issue before us is when does it become a crisis? You mean the three factors, the three triggers happening at the same time? They can happen at the same time, or they can happen uh, on their own uh, to set off a crisis. But the point is, if the crisis is recognized early, then you can really mitigate its effect. And uh, the credit goes to the uh, Asian countries, especially ASEAN countries affected by the Asian financial crisis. Mm -hmm. Most of us had a V-shaped recovery because we were able to manage it effectively. And because the conditions prevailing in our uh, countries were we had good initial c conditions mm -hmm. and we were able to address our vulnerabilities. Now, the, what I would like to highlight because this topic was on collaboration and uh, uh, 
uh, competing aspects within mm -hmm. the region. Yes, Asia and ASEAN is probably the most diverse region in the whole world. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we have complementarities. But what is more important and related to the question that you asked is what amongst the regulators and central banks, we have tremendous co collaboration mm -hmm. after the crisis. We now collaborate on surveillance and then financial safety nets. Yes. And also the surveillance allows us to share our assessments of the risks that might cause crisis. Mm -hmm. And we preemptively work on addressing those areas of vulnerability collectively. How and many crises have you preempted in the past year? Well, <laughs> the, the, the <laughs> biggest example that can demonstrate this is the effects of the global financial crisis. Asia emerged, especially Southeast Asia, really strongly mm. uh, out of this. And why were we able to absorb this massive uh, volatility and uh, in capital flows and uh, turmoils in financial markets? We were able to uh, intermediate these flows and we were better able to emerge mm -hmm. out of it without being uh, severely damaged. Mm -hmm. uh, then the volatility that happened when you had uh, the um, withdrawal of liquidity yes. uh, by the unwinding of the quantitative easing by the US. Mm -hmm. It did not stabilize our region, but the volume of flows, inflow surges when the quantitative easing occurred, and then the outflows that occurred after that uh, were massive, far more than what we saw during the Asian financial crisis. But again, we were able to emerge out of it not unscathed, of course we were affected, but it did not disrupt our uh, financial intermediation. It did not cause economic dislocation. Uh, so these are to the credit of what uh, Asia and ASEAN in particular collectively did. Simon, I think uh, Dr. Seti is trying to avoid giving us the prediction. <laughs> but, <laughs> but she will have to eventually do that. She is a sitting governor, central bank governor of a major economy. I would suggest she doesn't give a definite <laughs> answer. <laughs> but I'm happy She's to, doing her best. I've got no power. I'm happy to say anything you want. <laughs> no. I, I thought there was an off-the-record session. Anyway, Simon, what Please. do you see as the current threat to the world's economy? I think... Uh, I think the key part is that the global system is actually undergoing rapid change. Uh, the system we've gotten used to of the American predominance. I mean, America is still there, but the system is shifting. Americans feel it. We, we know it. Um, and this new equilibrium, if we can find one, has not been found. There are tensions in our region. We can feel them. There are global tensions. Uh, and these are both political security, but also economic and financial, you know. In the financial part, of course, Dr. Zetti is much more expert than I am. But if I look at it very simply, we have America perhaps tightening, uh, a bit of tightening, and yet we have uh, QE2, which in you know, European as well as Japanese, which are so big. And in a way, they are uh, un relatively uncoordinated. And my other concern, of course, is China. Mm -hmm. During the Asian crisis, these factors were very different. American economy is doing well. The West is doing well as a whole. China helped firm the UN. But right now, we are starting to see concerns about competitive devaluations. And China, you know, with its economy not doing so well, the temptation to, I, I think it would be wrong, mm -hmm. but the temptation to do something to the UN, I think, is starting to arise. I hope this is probably too pessimistic. But the overall uh, leadership we felt strongly during the Asian crisis of America being in charge, I think that part has slipped. Mm -hmm. And then, if I may, before giving the floor to others, one other point is domestically. The economic political issues at the global level are also exacerbated by problems within each country. Whether it's Occupy Wall Street, Occupy Central, everyone's occupied in a bad way. Uh, with this kind of domestic infighting, uh, of course there's some real issues we need to be addressed. Social inequality in so many countries, including my own, is now much more high on the agenda 
than ever before. And but these uh, amplify the national issues, the social issues amplify the global. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dr. Sorin, you're talking about both the... Don't com ask me to predict the next crisis, please. <laughs> are we already in one? <laughs> I, I think we are trying to manage small and big crises, anticipating big ones and trying to make make our preparations to contain mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. I think we have learned a lot from our own crisis. Remember, I became foreign minister because of the crisis. Yes, and you <laughs> love crisis. The, pre <laughs> the previous government just threw the, the um, white towel and then we had to take over. Mm -hmm. In the beginning, we managed the crisis. I think we did very well, and I think Dr. Seti referred to, to one, and that was the Chiang Mai initiative. We learned the lessons and uh, we listened to IMF, mm -hmm. except Malaysia, mm -hmm. bitter. <laughs> and they were right. Yes. Well, in the end, they were right. Uh, bitter medicine, you have to keep your interest rate high. You have to keep your, your budget uh, surplus. And you have to let all those financial and banking institutions fail. Mm -hmm. They have to face the logic of the market. Yes. 2008, Lehman Brothers, the West, got the same Tom Yam Kung syndrome. They call it hamburger syndrome. Mm -hmm. Some of them are too big to fail. Right. They don't have to maintain budget uh, surplus. Mm -hmm. They don't have to uh, keep interest rate high. So it's double standard. But the, po <laughs> the point is we learned the lesson, and we wanted to show to the world that East Asia, being a new locomotive of growth, of recovery, we want to contribute, not only to ourselves, not only to manage our own affairs, but also contributing to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Anything happens to Asia will have a tremendous impact now to the world, more than mm -hmm. 10 years ago, more than 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. So I think we learned the lessons. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've said to my colleagues many, in many places that the measure of our success is not how much we export, not how much we produce, not how much we accumulate our foreign reserves, but how much we contribute to the global structure of governance, financial and other things. And I think we have done quite well. So that's the, <laughs> so that's the complementations part. What about the competition? Well, what about? I think, I think Dr. Zeti referred to one, and that is the Chiang Mai Initiative. We began with 120 billion US dollars in this pool that 13 countries can draw down from if something to happen again, like in 1967. Uh, Thailand first, then Malaysia, then Indonesia, then the Philippines, and all the way to South Korea, the East Asian crisis. Well, we set up this thing, common pool, 120 billion. Later on, we increase it to 240 billion. It's being used as an example of self-help in the regions of the world. Uh, in the G20, they talk about this, and later on, some other regions uh, were trying to emulate what we set up. But the point is this. ASEAN contributed 20% of that 120 billion. Mm -hmm. Korea contributed 120% uh, into that 120 billion. Japan and China were supposed to contribute 60% of that 120 billion, later on 240. It took them over a year. Who should give more? That's the competition we like. <laughs> we the Japanese said, we have been helping Southeast Asia for a long time, industrializing. Now they are all exporting countries. We have to give more than China. You have just emerged. So China we said, we are becoming big, the second biggest economy soon. We can't let Japan to give more than us. So I we, think every region would like to have that kind of competition. <laughs> so we encourage continued <clears throat> fight between China and Japan. They should keep being enemies, right? Well, I mean... Once they become friends, then we are in trouble. On other, <laughs> on other issues, on other issues, they may be competitive. They have differences. But on this issue, they compete to help restore the stability and the confidence of the economies of East Asia. On other issues, yes, there are other crises on the horizon. But we, you know, we have to manage Dr. them. Seti, Dr. Suwin is suggesting that political rivalry is good for economic cooperation, especially among the giants, <laughs> right? <laughs> I, 
I would like to say, having a common vision and um, seeking out what are our common interests, a uh, more stronger driving force to uh, the um, integration and collaboration uh, of uh, our Asian region. And I do believe that we have enough uh, to recognize that collectively we will do better than rather trying to manage it on our own. The world is such that it cannot, uh, uh, it's a disadvantage to not to be part of the collective action. So when central bank governors of ASEAN meeting, how do they handle the central bank of Japan and central bank of China? How do they compete and how do they collaborate? How do we make sure that when they fight, they benefit us? We have not really worked in that direction. We have looked at the areas of what exactly we want to achieve. Like we want to have better surveillance, mm -hmm. better assessment of what are the eminent risks and vulnerabilities faced by the region that could destabilize us. And we believe that uh, if they keep their house in order, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, then it is a source of stability for mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. So I don't think there is that rivalry. And I also uh, beg to disagree with uh, uh, Simon Tay. Uh, on the f uh, he mentioned about uh, com the environment uh, precipitate uh, competitive depreciation. I think on the contrary, when our currencies were appreciating because of, it was because of the surges of inflows that many of us experienced, and then our financial markets rallying during these periods. Now, when there's a withdrawal of liquidity, uh, our currency are depreciating. Mm -hmm. We are not, most of the economies certainly that I know from our discussions with the central bank are not trying to depreciate our currency, on the contrary. Uh, and therefore, uh, um, it is an outcome of these volatile capital flows rather than uh, a policy, a distinct policy discretion. This is not rivalry between Malaysia and Singapore, no, definitely. Not. No. <laughs> I, I think it's, uh, no. <laughs> it's the difference of where we sit. I certainly didn't mean that central banks are, are asking for it. But if you look at, say, the export economy of Japan, the exporters clearly have gained from the almost 20% drop. Uh, so they have, in a way, from the producer's manufacturer's point of view, gained vis-a-vis, -vis, say, Korean products, mm -hmm. they claim market share. And similarly, when we look at the yen dropping, then for us, suddenly, we look relatively expensive from a Japanese point of view. So if we're trying to court Japanese investment, there is a temptation to turn to that as one element. I, I, I say this also because our, our dollar has been actually strengthening vis-a-vis uh, mm -hmm. -vis a basket. And now our, our own MS has said, well, you know, perhaps we'll go a little softer. Mm -hmm. And there is room for some of our countries to do that because in, the inflation we're facing isn't that high. So I'm saying that this is just one, to me, one symptom of an area where we need to hopefully find ways to c collaborate, find ways to harmonize rather than to compete. I'm against definitely uh, deflating for competition. Mm -hmm. But these, I think, I would just, you know, I guess as a think tank, I tend to point to risk, whereas the central bankers should always try to calm us down, you know, mm -hmm. and say oh, things are okay, we're managing. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other issue, I think, uh, uh, Dr. Zeti raised, I think, and your question about competition, I think clearly where global rules are possible and really we feel comfortable with a multilateral system, all of us should try to cooperate. But frankly, what I mean by the global disorder or the breakdown of the order, for small countries, and I mean not just Singapore small, but even Thailand small, uh, Malaysia small, ASEAN as a whole, uh, there will be times where this kind of competition, playing one-off, can help you help us. Uh, in the free trade agreements, I, I think that's certainly the case. Uh, there is some tension between the uh, US-led FTA, uh, uh, the TPP, as well as uh, you know, hopes that China will reinvigorate its own uh, FTA with ASEAN. Mm -hmm. So there is some sense of political competition. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to wait for you to, uh, to ask me a question because <laughs> you won't ask the question that I want to answer. <laughs> <laughs>
again, to, to illustrate that, that we collaborate and we compete at the same time. You know, East Asia has been known for, for a region that lacks institutional processes, systems, and uh, the, 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 the norms that would manage our differences. It was Henry Kissinger who made this statement at the end of last century. He said, as far as technology, innovation, uh, economic dynamism, yes, Dean Gareth is right. It's, he said, at that time, 20, 20th century Europe. But as far as institutions, process, and system, it's still 19th century Europe. The issue that uh, uh, Governor Zetti mentioned that uh, we shall have monitoring office, we shall have um, uh, AMRO in Singapore out of these 13 countries looking into each other's performances. Mm -hmm. What is more intrusive than looking over shoulders of how you manage your own macroeconomic issues? That's pretty collaborative, mm -hmm. but at the same time we compete. So we set up this monitoring office in Singapore mm -hmm. because this 220 billion US dollars fund belongs to every one of us. Mm -hmm. Something happens to Singapore, God forbid, you will have to draw down from this fund. So I need to know how you do your thing, same as Malaysia, same as Thailand. So along with the integration, along with collaboration, we have diminished this sense of isolation that I am the only one, nobody can intrude into my internal affairs because in integration, economic or otherwise, you will have both the upside and downside of integration. And what happened in 1997 is extremely illustrative because all of a sudden Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, the Philippines and South Korea, we realized that we were more integrated than we thought we were. So we had to create a new institution, a new office, new mechanism to collaborate among us. And we did. And that was the Chiang Mai initiative. Yes. Uh, I did want to add to that, that what is less known is the approach that Asia, in particular ASEAN, has taken towards becoming more integrated. Uh, of course, when we compare with Europe, it is all based on institutions. Uh, ins institutional arrangements that are quite rigid. Once you are part of uh, the European Union, these are uh, the arrangements. But for Asia, we have decided in the early 2000s that we're not going to pursue a single currency, for example, because mm -hmm. we are too diverse and we don't have the conditions to make that a viable option. But we are pursuing economic integration, which means trade and investment amongst ourselves, mm -hmm. and then financial integration as well. And we support these by having frameworks, arrangements, and collaborative um, mechanisms, uh, rather than institutions mm -hmm. like uh, a European Central Bank and other uh, um, uh, uh, such like institutional mm. arrangements. This then allows flexibility. Flexibility that allows participation by an individual country into that framework or into that mechanism based on a state of readiness. Mm. And then it also, because we have in our, uh, Singapore is a developed country. I uh, can't remember the per capita income is 40, 50,000. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, whereas then you, you have others uh, like Malaysia and Thailand. And so uh, where our income per capita is 11, 12,000. So in this kind of circumstances, it's not a level playing field. And if you participate together, uh, you will lose out because uh, of certain circumstances or your stage of development or uh, the kind of financial system that you have. Mm -hmm. And therefore, this framework that we have developed, especially, for example, the ASEAN um, Banking Integration Framework, mm -hmm. uh, ABIF it's called, and it's just being signed off. 
and it allows participation, flexibility of participation based on a state of readiness, uh, and then it has uh, reciprocity in it. That means if I give you this, then in return, you should also uh, reciprocate in the same way, and so on. And that is how we are progressing forward, rather than, uh, um, and the fact that we don't have a single currency mm -hmm. allows us to adjust the currency. Uh, because in my view, there are three things that need to adjust when you have an imbalance. First, the demand, then prices, and then the exchange rate. And if you cannot dis uh, adjust the exchange rate, like in the case of Greece, for example, uh, then you have to adjust the demand and, and prices. And that can be very painful when you rely on just one part of the, uh, the economy to adjust. So the fact that in Asia we have flexible exchange rate regimes now uh, is another means by which uh, we have the flexibility to adjust. Mm -hmm. So all these factors uh, allow for Asia to become more integrated and more cohesive as a force to be reckoned with. But Simon, AEC, ASEAN Economic Community, yes. has this inherent combination of cooperation and competition. How do we accommodate both and make AEC successful? Well, I think like, you know, in all life, competition isn't necessarily a bad thing at all. Uh, it challenges us each to be better. And we have to do that because ASEAN, even though we're trying to integrate, isn't the only region or sub-region in the whole world. You know, in, you know, if we don't get our act together as a group, maybe in 10 years' time, people will be talking more about Africa or some sub-region of Africa. So we've got to, in a way, egg each other on to do better. Uh, uh, hopefully, not a negative competition, but you know, like if you can run this fast, I want to run faster, and we keep we keep pushing each other on. Uh, we feel this quite strongly in Singapore. You know, our costs are so high now mm -hmm. that uh, we really need to be as efficient and productive as possible, and innovative as possible. And you know, we hear Thailand also wants to be innovative, and you know, Thai actually are more naturally innovative than Singaporeans. I can tell you. So <laughs> we, we do face a lot of competition. Um, now, but the other element I think in the AEC is very much our diversity. Uh, you know, I think I, I really welcome Dr. Zetti's uh, remarks that we have to not just frame our diversity correctly, but also to use it. You know, when I look at our production uh, as network as a whole in, in ASEAN alone, um, you go from very low base potential to go up like Myanmar or Laos, Cambodia, to the really industrialized middle income countries, you know, the really like uh, Thailand and Malaysia. In certain fields you're in, you're really world class. And then you go to Singapore, which hopefully can keep some of the financials and other things. And across now, I would say we're less competitive, direct competition than we were 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, now it's much more varied, so we can actually complement each other better. I, mm -hmm. think, I think that's my overall picture mm -hmm. for ASEAN. The size matter in this context of competition and collaboration. ASEAN, on the one hand, then you have China, and you have the United States, and you have Europe, Japan, how do we as ASEAN handle this competition and collaboration among the giants? You ask the question, I don't want to answer. <laughs> you do want to answer? <laughs> no. no, of course size is important. That's, that's the genesis of ASEAN. Back in early 2000, the leaders of ASEAN realize right away, and I remember Prime Minister Ko Chok Tong, yes. who said in New York that the oxygen of foreign in direct investment has been taken out of Southeast Asia, being diverted to China, being diverted to India. So we have to get our act together. So the idea of the community came into being. But the uniqueness about ASEAN is the fact that we are diverse, we are each Boutique economies, complementary and competing at the same time. Singapore is a service economy. Uh, you know, banking, finance, insurance, logistics, transport, whatever, telecommunication. Singapore is best in that. Thailand is agriculture, and the prime minister is worried about the fact that you know, if you don't give them good prices, the farmer is going to walk away from the farm, and we are going to be in trouble because that is Thailand's unique feature strong agriculture, strong food production, food processing, um, 
it's, it's also certainly the automobile sector. So, and then Malaysia is electronic. Malaysia is also very good at computers. Malaysia is good at trading. The interesting thing is this. ASEAN together has a combined GDP of 2.5 trillion US dollars. If it were to be a country, it's number seven ranking in the world. And we trade slightly more than that. Economists from Wharton can tell us why we trade more than we produce. We, tra we trade about 2.6, 0.5. But the interesting part is this. Of the 2.6 that we trade, plus mm -hmm. that we trade, only 25% we trade among ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that is very, very critical. An economic community cannot be sustained with only 25% of their trade among themselves inter ASEAN, intra ASEAN. And that is where the, um, you know, small and medium-sized industry can come in. That's why Singapore investing in Malaysia, Malaysia investing in Thailand, Thailand investing in Indonesia, we have to cross borders to make sure that trade among us and between us is more than 25%. And we have to have that deadline, that timeline. Mm -hmm. In the year 2020, we have to have 35. In the year 2035, we have to have 40. Without that growth in that sector of trade intra-ASEAN, this in spite of the size, half of India, almost half of China, a very strong foundation for competition with the diversity that we have, but unless we have that real economic integration, yes. trading among ourselves, Europe trade 60 plus percent, NAFTA among themselves in North America, 60 plus percent among themselves. The rest, this, this trade with the world, we trade with the world 75 percent. We trade among ourselves 25%. That's for the alumni of Wharton <laughs> to figure out and help us how to increase. And we can see that SMEs must cross border. Yes. So Dr. Zeti, when is the next crisis coming? <laughs> I've run out of time. If we manage it right, it will be very brief. And therefore, I'm more confident given that our level of resilience continues to increase, our levels of collaboration continues to be strengthened, and therefore uh, we can look forward to, uh, well, volatile times, but uh, the prospect that we have to recover quickly and rapidly. No more time. One observation, <laughs> one, one observation, please. You one observation. Have the last day. <laughs> There are three men and one woman on yes. this stage. Yes. She has the advantage because she had gone through many crises yes. and managed it well. Yes. Not because she is a woman and not because we are Harvardians, you too, <laughs> but because she is Wartanian. Wow. wow. I didn't know you were one of the sponsors of this. Um. <laughs> so in conclusion, the crisis will come if you're not careful. Yes. But if it comes, it will be brief. Yes. Because we will collaborate in a way that we will make the crisis, even if it happens, very brief and solvable. So let's give a big hand to the panel. <laughs> <laughs>